Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. We're all aware of the rush to the outdoors that the COVID pandemic has spawned. From coast to coast, national parks, national forests, and state parks are really crowded, if not overrun at times, by visitors. Whether it continues now that the pandemic seems to be easing will be interesting to watch. This is Kurt Rappenchuk, your host at National Parks Traveler. One part of the country that has seen record-breaking visitation has been the Outer Banks of North Carolina, where Cape Hatteras National Seashore, Fort Raleigh National Historic Site, and the Wright Brothers Memorial combined welcomed nearly 4 million visitors last year. To discuss that record visitation and outline some of the risks to oceanfront homes at Rodan from rising sea levels and storms, we've invited Superintendent Dave Halleck to join us. We'll be back in a minute with Dave. Wild Tribute is lifestyle apparel founded for our parks and public lands. We donate 4% of our proceeds to support America's most wild and historic places. This is our Wild Tribute. Together, we can and will make a difference for the parks. You can learn more at wildtribute.com. The Everglades Foundation, the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. Welcome back to The Traveler, Dave. Thank you, Kurt. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, as I, as I said in that introduction, you guys had quite the year in 2021. It seems like visitation was off the charts. You saw 3.2 million visitors at the National Seashore, which was 20% higher than 2020, which might not be surprising because some visitation in 2020 was impacted certainly by the, the COVID pandemic. And then there was that rebound last year as people decided we're going to get out into nature and enjoy it. But still, 35% higher than the 10-year average? W where are they coming from and where are you putting them? Yeah, that's correct, Kurt. Uh, we had a lot of visitors in 2021. But interestingly, uh, you referenced the fact that we were 20% higher than 2020. Interestingly, 2020, which was the first summer uh, in, in North America with COVID, we had the busiest year that we had had in the prior 17. So 2020 would have been off the charts. Uh, 2021 even exceeded that. Um, so both years were extremely busy and higher than certainly most of our staff have ever experienced. Uh, where are we putting everybody? You know, that's, that's a good question. Uh, as parks continue to have more and more visitors coming, we start to test this, uh, this, this theory or this discussion of the term carrying capacity. You know, we were able to fit everybody. We do have 75 miles of beaches. Uh, luckily, uh, when it came to planning for beach management many, many years ago, we zoned the beach in a way where we have different types of access and experience. So by and large, uh, the feedback that we have from our visitors is they still had a great time at the seashore. Uh, but certainly there were times and places where there were quite a few people here. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm... I'm I'm wondering, um, obviously summer rentals is, is a big um, source of your visitors, but I'm guessing that's kind of, there's a, there's a limit to how many rental properties there are out there. Yeah, it's interesting. We've always said the same thing, like, you know, can it really get any busier if every, you know, uh, every bed is full? And um, I guess the answer is maybe. So I spoke to some realtors who said, yes, we've been booked solid every week, every night, uh, for the entire summer. But what happens is there are lots of people who have said, you know what, I'm going to take the upstairs of my house that live in the Outer Banks and turn it into a bed and breakfast. Or I'm going to rent out the finished garage over or the finished space over my garage. Or I'm going to take my backyard 
put a sewer pipe in that connects to my sewer system, put a pedestal with some electricity and water and rent it out to an RV. So we've seen more and more of those types of, of, of properties spring up, which actually means that in fact, there is a possibility of having more and more people down here. They're just overnighting in, I guess what I would say are new or also non-traditional lodging situations. Very creative, very creative. Do you have a feel for where these people are coming from? I mean, is it, is it the, the, the stay vacation or is it um, just the, the Carolinas and, and maybe Virginia? Or do you still draw from the entire eastern seaboard and, and maybe out across the country? Uh, yeah, great, great question. We actually have a visitor study that we have referenced many times. It was done by the Outer Banks Visitors Bureau in 2014. I believe they released it in 2015. So the data are a little bit dated at this point, but my guess is they're probably generally transferable to today. And we find that the majority of the visitors, number one, are here for on average 5.8 nights. So that makes sense. Most of the beach home rentals here are for a week. And so it's a little less than a week, of course, because there are plenty of people during the shoulder season that do weekends, stay at hotels and camp for a shorter duration. Uh, what we also know from that visitor study is that the large majority of our visitors actually come from the Richmond, Virginia area, with a lot of other visitors coming from the Virginia Beak, Norfolk, Chesapeake area, uh, Washington, D.C., um, the New York City, Tri-State area, and Philadelphia, uh, Raleigh, uh, Charlotte area in North Carolina. So we do have a pretty good feel for, for where those visitors are coming from. But it's also amazing because oftentimes you'll You'll be driving on Highway 12 and you'll see a, a license plate from Florida or from Georgia or from Texas. And uh, we find frequently that people are not just driving from slightly west or north of here, but they're coming from places like Florida because we offer such a unique, uh, unspoiled experience. What about international visitors? We do have some international visitors. Uh, I don't really have a good sense for how significant that is. Um, also, with COVID, uh, my understanding is there was quite a bit less uh, international visitation, obviously, because of some issues with coming across the border. Definitely, certain places in the Outer Banks are um, sort of locally known for their popularity with Canadian visitors. So, for example, we have a place that is technically called the Hallover Day Use Area. It's a sound side visitor access point, very, very popular for uh, wind-based water sports like windsurfing and kiteboarding. And it is um, colloquially referred to as um, Canadian Hall. So um, <laughs> certainly we, we do have uh, quite a few people that come uh, internationally. You know, yeah, international visitation has been down the past couple of years for a variety of reasons. It might be down again this year because of the, the, the war over the Ukraine and what that, that is doing to, to um, energy prices. And I'm, I'm sure um, airline tickets are going to skyrocket and uh, whatnot. I'm just wondering, you mentioned um, carrying capacity. What, what if things return, quote unquote, to normal, whatever that might be, and you do see a, an, a return of international visitors and, and – um, broader appeal to the you know east coasters the the south and whatnot How, do you know what your population limit is your visitation limit is yeah we don't uh Curtis, it's a great question i think this is a topic that many national parks are are looking into is trying to understand that and uh uh you know i had a mentor who many years ago said uh, something to the effect of the, the, the least studied animal in a national park is the human being, right? And so when you start to looking into this topic of carrying capacity, uh, it's challenging because it really is a social science or a human dimension of public lands management. And uh, certainly we are, I think, increasing our understanding of uh, the human dimension of, of, of managing national parks, but it's something that, that we have a lot of uh, additional learning to do. So um, it's, it's a tough one. It's something that we strive to learn more about. As a matter of fact, we're going to have an in-depth uh, visitor survey done here. It's being done by the National Park Service's Social Science Program, which is part of our uh, Natural Resource Stewardship and Science Directorate out of Washington. And so it'll be interesting as they start to dive in uh, and extract more information about why are people coming here? 
What's driving them? What type of activities are they doing while they're here? Are they feeling crowded while they're here? Um, it, it'll help us begin to understand that a little bit. Um, but we have not implemented any type of a formal caring capacity study at this time. Yeah, that that crowded experience. Um, I've had some discussions and, and interactions with traveler readers, and you know, somebody brought up the the possibility that different different generations have different expectations of what a national park experience is. And so, you know, growing up in the last century and introduced to national parks in the 1960s and 1970s, obviously, I've got my personal perception of what that national park experience should be versus, you know, my 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 sons and what they expect and, and you know, other generations, younger generations. And so, that's got to be a tough one to answer what the, the visitor experience is and what it should be. Uh, it definitely is because I think you just uh, summed up the answer to that question is it depends who you ask. Uh, and, it, and it depends on the baseline that that person has experienced in the past and what their expectations are. Uh, so there are many people that might live around a crowded urban area and going to a city park is essentially what they expect when they come to a national park where there might be a high density of visitors, maybe just a different background in a different setting. Uh, and then there are folks that come to national parks that are experiencing more of uh, what many would refer to as a solitary or wilderness-like experience. And so I think the challenge for land managers like uh, myself these days is to, to do our best to, of course, you know, um, manage based on Congress's intent, but also find ways for different visitors with different expectations to meet their goals and, and have an opportunity to have those different experiences. Sure, sure. Now, you can, you can push all that human social science aside, I imagine, if you just focus on the natural resources and how that visitation is impacting those. I mean, I remember back, gosh, it's been... Uh, 14 or 15 or, or more years when Cape Hatteras was a, a controversial location because of the uh, the access question and, and sea turtles that come ashore and, and endangered or threatened um, bird species like the, the pipe and plover. How are the natural resources doing today? Yeah, they're doing well. You know, I think, uh, Kurt, our challenge in managing things like nesting wildlife on the beaches is really to do our best to minimize and remove the human disturbance factor. Um, but what we've learned over time is uh, just like human health, um, that's just one component that influences the health and the long-term trajectory of a lot of these species. So I think we have done a very good job there. Uh, I look at the architects of our offered vehicle management plan which is now, uh, as you pointed out, more than a decade old. And I think they did a really nice job of uh, minimizing human disturbance in the national park. We've made some small tweaks to that, but generally we're imp implementing that plan. And it is somewhat uh, resistant to increases in visitation because it's really based on completely removing human activity from some distance, call it a buffer, from wildlife nesting activity and proactively setting up what we call these pre-nesting areas, which are we're anticipating where birds might nest and closing them completely to entry so that there are no chances of human disturbance discouraging those birds from nesting or adversely impacting their nesting early on. So I think we have a really, really nice plan there. What we have learned over time is clearly there are multiple other factors that affect these species. We have predators, non-native predators included. We have massive erosion and um, habitat degradation, much of which is being influenced by climate change and sea level rise. Um, so we're having to really think differently about the future of wildlife management at the parks. We're talking today with Dave Halleck, the superintendent of National Parks of Eastern North Carolina. Um, right now, the topic is record visitation at his parks. We're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. 
In addition to some of the best rates in the country, Interior Federal Credit Union gives back their members more than other financial institutions in the form of dividends and low or no fees. With higher dividend rates, you can earn more in all your accounts, like certificates, money markets, or even a checking account. They focus to make sure that their members aren't being nickeled and dimed every time they make a transaction. That's the beauty of Interior Federal Credit Union. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Petrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with the breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com, P-O-T-R-E-R-O, group.com. Nova Scotia, 8,000 miles of coastline dotted with colorful fishing villages, quaint coastal towns, and an abundance of scenic natural beauty. Home to two national parks, Cape Breton Highlands and Kajimakujik. Spend your nights under a canopy of twinkling stars. Spend your days exploring trails, beaches, historical waterways, and tons of cultural and recreational experiences. Visit NovaScotia.com today and start planning your natural getaway. Okay, we're back with Superintendent Halleck. Dave, I'm, I'm curious, um, you had a 58% increase in campground reservations last year. Any idea how much that is due to the decision, I think it was back in 2020, to open up the Ocracoke campground year round? Yeah, uh, thanks, Kurt. Uh, most of the increase in visitation that we're seeing is probably not related to that. We do see relatively no, uh, low visitor numbers in the Ocracoke campground during the winter time. Uh, I think actually, just to give you an example, last week, I think we had seven of our 126 campsites uh, reserved. So it, we're not seeing a ton of, of activity during the winter time, but actually that's okay. And to some degree, that's what we were shooting for. To circle back to the earlier conversation, we were looking to find ways to provide a camping experience where you might not be elbow to elbow and the campground would be full. And we were able to achieve that. We've also been able to achieve it by managing it almost exclusively with volunteers. So a really, really nice win-win uh, uh, situation there. I believe the primary factors that are driving our incredible increase in campground occupancy are two things. The first one is we have gone to site-specific campground reservations. So now our campers have the ability on an iPhone, on a computer, you know, up, up to many months in advance to know exactly which site they're getting to have uh, the certainty that the site is theirs for a certain period of time and to do, I think, much more detailed trip planning. So that's one aspect. The second aspect, I think, is just interrelated with the camping boom, uh, the boom with recreational vehicle sales, and the increased popularity of national parks that has come uh, as a result of COVID-19. Those two factors are most likely what have really driven up our occupancy in the campgrounds. Do you have uh, full hookups at uh, Ocracoke? We do not. We have uh, just uh, bare bones camping sites uh, there, and uh, we are striving to provide electricity and water. And one of the reasons that we're really striving to provide electricity and one of the benefits that we've seen in the Oregon Inlet campground, where about 45 of our sites now have electricity and water, is to manage the natural soundscape. Uh, most Park Service and Forest Service campgrounds allow visit, uh, visitors to run generators. Uh, there are quiet hours, oftentimes from like 10 until 6 or 7 in the morning. But the reality is for many of these campgrounds where the temperatures can be in the 90s, I mean, we have lots of people that are air conditioning their tents, believe it or not. They're running generators and hooking up air conditioners in their tents because, you know, these are beach campgrounds. There's not a lot of shade. So by allowing folks, especially in RVs, to have an ability to run their HVAC units, it has dramatically lowered the noise level in the campground and made for a much uh, more peaceful camping experience. You don't have uh, noise generating from the, the AC units? They're ex you'd be surprised. They're extremely quiet. Uh, so very little uh, noticeable noise from the AC units, at least that I've, I've seen. No, I was just wondering, there was a, the 21st Century Campground Design Guide, so to speak, that, that came out earlier this year. And, you know, it talked about a lot of issues, 
you know, obviously there's a lot of RV traffic out there. The RVs are a little bit bigger perhaps than they had been in the past. Um, what can national parks do to accommodate those changes? And so I, I'm curious, you know, electricity, like you mentioned, could serve multiple purposes um, from reducing the, the noise level to um, making it more comfortable year round in, in a park campground. So do you envision major changes to any of your campgrounds um, to accommodate these? Uh, I do. So, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm just not sure. I think the answer to your question is absolutely we will. Really the question is not if we'll change the campgrounds, it's when, and that's going to be largely based on funding. If you think about our campgrounds to some degree, most of these campgrounds were built in the 1950s, right? And rarely are we able to use, you know, very few people are using a kitchen that was installed in a home from 1950. The home might still be usable because it was built solid out of a brick uh, foundation. Um, but in most cases, you know, the wiring has been redone, the plumbing's been redone, the uh, even things like the, the, the kitchens, perhaps even the ductwork have been redone. So if you think about that and translate that thought to a campground, thinking that we're gonna be able to manage 2022 and future campground visitation using a campground that was designed in 1950, it, it's definitely a challenge. Everything from the size of the parking pads, sometimes barely even fit a truck, let alone an RV in a truck. And, and just other things. Many campers are expecting other modern conveniences like dishwashing stations, which by the way, are tremendously beneficial for reducing the amount of food litter. You know, if you don't give somebody a dishwashing station, they're going to wash their dishes one way or another, most likely in the showers. And so uh, you can try to enforce that, but it's really challenging. So trying to, to meet these modern needs, I think, um, is important if we're going to successfully manage the campgrounds. We do have some, I guess what I call campground modernization plans for all four of our campgrounds. We would widen most of our circular access roads. We would make the driveway upon which vehicles and RVs park a little bit longer. And for a substantial number of the sites, we would provide water and electricity uh, to help meet the, the modern demands and also uh, reduce the noise level in the campground. We would add things like dishwashing stations. Uh, but there, you know, there are questions about how far do you go? Do you put a washer and dryer? in place, you know, interestingly, we've been to many Canadian national parks, my family and I, and almost every one of them in their modernized campgrounds at a minimum has a couple of washers and dryers uh, for their, their campgrounds, but still a very uh, remote park-like feeling. So I, I think we're, we're in a process through the report that you mentioned and uh, examining individual park needs of, of trying to uh, modernized campgrounds in, in a way for our future. Yeah, I was wondering about that report because I, I guess you probably have a little bit more space to work with because you're dealing with um, a beach-type environment. You don't have a lot of um, big forests around your campgrounds like a, a Yellowstone or a Grand Teton. So uh, bringing those changes are probably easier at Cape Hatteras than, than it would be to, to, say, Rocky Mountain. What about new campgrounds? I mean, the fifty-eight um, percent increase in campground reservations does that does that um, have you thinking about? You know, maybe we should create a new campground. Thinking, yes. Uh, seriously, thinking, not yet. Uh, you know, and the reason for that is we really need to look at examine ideas like new campgrounds really thoroughly from the top to the bottom. Uh, the ideas might sound really simple at first. Um, but obviously building a new campground in most cases is going to have new natural resource impacts. You've got to have an ability to bring in power and water to the campground. You've got to staff the campground and have some type of a business model, hopefully, where you can keep up the, invest the initial investment that you made in the campground. And for us on the coast here, we have a lot more to think about. We have rising sea levels, um, increased frequency of storms and, and flooding. So um, I think right now we're focused on trying to adapt the existing facilities we have, but we're not in a mode of trying to increase the number of facilities that we have because we don't want to overcommit uh, for things that we just don't have the ability to take care of in the future. Now, up, up the road from the National Seashore, you've got Fort Raleigh National Historic Site and the Wright Brothers National Memorial. 
they were popular places last year as well. They were very popular. And uh, a lot of it was, you know, the beach drew people here. And those were things to do when you had time. Uh, maybe it was a rainy day. Uh, um, sometimes we call it the sunburn activity. So most of the renters that come and rent their beach houses uh, arrive on a Saturday or Sunday. And oftentimes they're a little bit sunburned by Tuesday afternoon. So we actually find that parks like Wright Brothers and Fort Raleigh tend to be busiest in the middle of the week. Uh, maybe it's that sunburn phenomenon. Uh, maybe it's uh, uh, just looking for a break from the beach or something else to do. But they were absolutely very busy. Uh, I was just so impressed, uh, Kurt, with our staff this summer because most of our visitor centers actually have been open now for 19 months uh, with COVID. We limited the number of visitors in the visitor centers. Obviously, masks were required. We found ways to socially distance both the visitors and our staff. And we were able to manage that very, very successfully and still provide that type of an experience. So really, our, our staff did an amazing job. Yeah, that was my next question. I mean, you know, what are the challenges of managing all these visitors? I mean, is there enough space? We kind of touched on that. You just mentioned you have enough staff, but we keep hearing about how the Park Service staffing has been flat for quite a few years. Um, certainly, the, the visitation that you've seen, you haven't seen a, a, an equal increase in staffing to manage that. Yeah, you know, staffing is always a challenge. Uh, really, the, you know, the challenge for me in my in my seat is to find a way to ensure that the activities that are occurring in the park are commensurate with the staffing level. So if we don't have the staff to have the programs that might be ideal, or maybe we had years in the past, we may not have those programs. We really strive to maximize the land area that's open at the park, and we've been lucky to be able to continue to, to keep our lands you know, fully open. But you know, there are some things that happen that sometimes the, the season, uh, shoulder seasons uh, have fewer programs than maybe we would have preferred. We may start lighthouse climbing uh, seasons later uh, because we just don't have the staff. But generally speaking, we are, uh, are finding ways to, to continue to manage the park and, and minimize impacts to the park. Now, you have a text alert system in place that visitors can take advantage of. How does that work, and, and what is the benefit to the visitor? Yeah, so the text alert system, I'm really proud of Mike Barber. He's our public affairs specialist. He's always uh, either thinking outside the box or thinking about how we embrace technology because there is no longer – uh, one way to just reach our visitors, right? The, the days of the park newspaper that somebody might get in an entrance station as the primary uh, communication are, are no longer there. Um, so we have social media, we have press releases, we have email, and we have partners that are also messaging and connecting with folks. So the text alert system is meant to be a way for us to get important messages to our visitors through a very simple text message which I think many people are used to, you know, my, my kids go to school in the area and if there's a, you know, a delayed opening because of a storm or a snow day, that's how they notify me. So it's the same concept, very simple. Uh, I believe you text uh, NPS OBX to 333111. You can stop anytime. And it allows us to text emergency messages, uh, messages about public meetings. For example, you mentioned the public meeting that, uh, that we're, we're having related to uh, erosion and homes collapsing in Rodanthe, uh, and just another way to reach, reach our visitors and communicate. Interesting. We're joined today by Dave Halleck, the superintendent of National Parks of Eastern North Carolina. Among the topics is oceanfront houses at risk of toppling into the Atlantic. We'll be back after a short break. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That is why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people, inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, 
Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Okay, we're back today with Dave Halleck, the superintendent of National Parks of Eastern North Carolina. Dave, one of the topics I wanted to talk about is um, houses falling into the Atlantic Ocean. Um, you had uh, a house up at Rodanthe, um, I believe, um, fall early in February, um, collapse into the Atlantic. Um, what can you tell us about that? Has all the debris been cleaned up? Has there been any environmental contamination? This is uh, an interesting topic, uh, Kurt. Yes, on February 9th, we had a, uh, I think it was a five bedroom, three bath home, about 2000 square feet, typical beach home on stilts uh, that collapsed. Uh, it collapsed probably sometime the night before or in the early morning hours of February 9th. We found out about it at seven in the morning. Within a couple of hours, our staff were already observing debris from the collapsed home more than seven miles from the site. And uh, it's been a real challenge to manage. Uh, we were in immediate contact with the homeowner who did hire a contractor. Uh, the contractor, I believe, is still working periodically, but they worked fairly intensively uh, for at least a week. And uh, they were cleaning up what in the end became about 15 miles of beach, uh, cleaning the debris from that collapsed home that was being spread up and down the beach from the waves and, and the longshore currents. Um, I would say the majority of the, the, the large debris has uh, been cleaned up by the contractor and members of the community and our volunteers and our staff. It's really taken a village to make that happen. There still is debris out there. Like any beach, uh, some of the debris unfortunately gets covered as sand washes over it within the intertidal zone and then a week later becomes uncovered and may uh, get moved around. So we expect to see some level of debris for, for many more weeks. And uh, we're hoping that the homeowner uh, continues to assist us, uh, but ultimately, um, you know, we're having to uh, perform some of the cleanup activity. Now, looking at the, the pictures that uh, your staff posted, I mean, it, it wasn't a remote house. Um, There's quite a few houses running up the, the shoreline there. What's the situation? I mean, how do you how do you address the the danger that those houses are at risk of? Um, you know, Cape Hatteras, of course, is a barrier island. Barrier islands tend to move around a little bit. Do you have you been able to pinpoint pinpoint the cause of the February 9th collapse? Was it was it the natural movement of the barrier island? Was it sea level rise? Was it erosion caused by storms? All the above, Kurt. So I I can't comment on the structural stability of the house other than to let you know that the Dare County building inspector had uh, notified the homeowner through essentially a tag on the outside of the building and letters that the home uh, was no longer safe. So it, it clearly had some level of structural stability issues. Pr prior to its collapse? Correct. How did that come to be? And are there also aggravating issues related to erosion? Absolutely. So that home prior to its collapse had its support pilings at high tide in the water. And so, you know, uh, it's really amazing. I met a neighbor of the home or the homeowner that collapsed just yesterday. He lives across the street diagonal from the home. He's owned his home since 1979. Uh, his name is Steve. And I said, Steve, tell me what it was like looking out from your home towards the Atlantic Ocean in 1979. And he said, Dave, do you want me to show you? And I said, sure. I wasn't sure exactly what he meant. He said, well, come inside. So I went inside his home. He invited me inside and he had a photograph. He wasn't sure if it was 79 or 80 or 81, but somewhere around the early 80s of the view from his deck, looking at the home that had just collapsed three weeks ago. And past that home in the photograph, you could see that there was plenty of you know, dry sand backyard, and then this massive sand dune, and you really could barely even see the water behind it. So 
just a completely different situation 22 years ago. And uh, he was just you know, talking how incredible these changes are. But the changes are not surprising. These are barrier islands, as you mentioned. Uh, erosion is a natural process, uh, process that occurs um, in these areas. It's part of what actually, in some cases, sustains the, uh, the islands and allows them to be uh, you know, almost a living physical form. And uh, to some degree, we've stopped that by building dunes here many, many decades ago. Um, but this section of Rodanthe is one of the fastest ero eroding areas of the seashore. Um, our latest estimates put that erosion at about four meters per year. So, you know, that's more than 12 feet. That, that's a lot. Uh, and uh, so clearly, um, many of these homes in this neighborhood have no dry sand beach in front of them anymore. And uh, that makes them extremely vulnerable. And when we talk about vulnerability, especially in terms of climate change and sea level rise, vulnerability is a product of two things. It's the exposure, and these homes have what I would call extremely high exposure. They're in the ocean pretty much, especially at high tide. And then sensitivity, how strong and resilient is the home? So these are older homes, they have structural deficiencies, and they're highly exposed. It's it's the perfect storm for collapse. Are they are they vacation homes? Are they occupied year round? Uh, my understanding is most of them are rental homes, vacation homes. I'm not sure. Uh, I can't comment on every one of the homes, but most of them appear to have a, a vacation rental placard on the outside. And it's my understanding that they are mostly in um, uh, rental programs. This particular neighborhood has 11 homes. Uh, as of last week, eight of the 11 homes has, have been determined by the Dare County Building Inspector to be unsafe. Uh, and uh, at least a couple of those homes, if not three, have been uh, determined to be in a state of potential collapse. And so we expect one or more of these homes to collapse any hour, any day now. Wow. Um, obviously, you've been in contact with uh, residents and, and county officials and, and maybe state officials as well. Is there a solution? Do you just sit back and, and wait for them to collapse? Yeah, that is the question that everybody is wrangling with uh, right now. Uh, certainly, as I've said many times, uh, we want to shift from what, what we're engaging in right now, which is damage mitigation to damage avoidance. We do not want to have damage and litter all across miles of a national seashore. Um, I believe many of the homeowners want to do the same thing, uh, but they uh, have, have communicated to the, us that they're not able to receive an insurance payout for their home for, by proactively demolishing it, which, which makes a little sense. You know, if you use uh, the equivalent of a car, you're probably not going to have your car totaled and receive an insurance reimbursement until the car is actually in an accident in total. So it's our understanding that many of these homeowners are actually waiting for the ocean to take the home so that they can then get an insurance reimbursement. Um, and then also, you know, perform a cleanup, uh, which the last collapsed homeowner, uh, you know, did, did do and is still, still continuing. Uh, but it's, it's a real struggle there. You know, there does not appear to be a mechanism from the county's perspective to force the homeowner to remove the home. So it's it's really challenging. We, we are looking into this. We're looking at boundary issues and, and certainly uh, speaking with uh, attorneys and advisors within the Department of Interior uh, to try to formulate a long-term strategy that is going to minimize future impacts to the park. Now, one of the interesting situations um, that we haven't touched on is when those homes were constructed I believe, and, and correct me, they were outside the national seashore boundaries. That's correct. They were uh, clearly outside the seashore when they were constructed on private property. But but now they're some of them are inside, right, because of the high tide level? Uh, I would say that is possible. Uh, generally speaking, uh, our understanding of the ownership, and uh, this extends beyond just the federal ownership of a beach, uh, but is a very common principle when it comes to land ownership in coastal areas, uh, it's often referred to as the public trust doctrine, is that uh, even though the dry sand beach may be eroding, that we are generally owning between the low tide line 
and the high tide line. And when I say we, I mean all Americans, right? Because the park is owned by, by all Americans. So um, there has certainly been discussion uh, that we need to really further understand, are these houses truly now in that zone? That zone is referred to as the foreshore and uh, essentially on, on federal property. So that, that's something that we're looking into. Does that give the, the Park Service authority to, to basically condemn the house because it's in danger of falling in and, and perhaps the homeowner can collect insurance because their house has been condemned? Yes, I, I don't know the answer to that question yet, but I can tell you it's certainly a topic of discussion and a question that we're receiving frequently. Interesting situation. We'll be watching that one. It's um, early March now when we're talking. Um, a lot of national parks, national seashores have seen their seasons stretch a little bit. The shoulder season um, has elongated or shortened, depending on how you look at it. What's the situation at Cape Hatteras? When do you expect to see crowds showing up? I mean, I'm I'm sitting at 6,500 feet in the Rocky Mountains of Utah, and um, it's going to hit mid 60 degrees now. Um, I, I want to go out for a bike ride. I'm, I'm guessing it's probably getting uh, warmer earlier at uh, Cape Hatteras. Uh, yes. So Buxton is, uh, I guess, sort of the heart or the central of Cape Hatteras National Seashore. It's where the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse is. And uh, as we're speaking right now, it's 70 degrees and the high is expected to be 73. So uh, I would say we're there. Uh, Kurt, certainly we're not having the level of visitors that we expect that really, really ramps up around Memorial Day. Uh, But there are plenty of folks that are beginning to to come uh, to the park. And I would say, actually, we saw quite a bit of visitation all winter. And uh, we we see that probably as a new new trend. Uh, There really is no down season anymore. um, But certainly the, the levels of visitor numbers do decline a little bit during the winter time. Um, so now we're into March. We're, we're starting to sp- see folks come and visit for spring break. And I think those numbers will just continue to climb up through April and May until we hit Memorial Day. Uh, certainly uh, from that point through the end of August will be um, the highest level of visitor activity we expect. Uh, but September, October and November will be very busy as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if it wasn't a, a 2000 mile drive or so, I'd, I'd come out and, and pitch my tent for sure. on one of your campgrounds, it's a great experience and uh, hard to beat. Well, Dave, thanks so much for catching up with us on situations at Cape Hatteras and uh, Fort Raleigh, as well as the Wright Brothers National Memorial. Um, fascinating sites and well worth the visit. And I can understand um, why people want to come visit your parks. I just uh, looking forward to see how you continue to manage them. So everybody does get that national park experience that they're seeking excellent thank you so much for having me kurt it's been a pleasure that was dave halleck the superintendent of the national parks of eastern north carolina next week we're going to be talking about efforts to have the biden administration adopt a national biodiversity strategy what would that do and how would it be implemented that's next week on national parks traveler for the traveler this is kurt repencheck see you in the parks The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit nationalparkstraveler.org.